Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 782 for the 1st of October 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you from a daylight saving changed Sydney, Australia. Our clocks went forward somewhere in the wee hours of the morning. And it's that time of the year when some of us get a visit from the hay fever fairy. Hmm, not as nice as the skeptical fairy godmother angel from the internet, the Hay fever fairy came to visit me a couple of days ago, and my response was to sneeze a lot. Do you get hay fever? I wonder if you do. I hope you don't, because it's very unpleasant. The cure may be living under the ocean. I need Ringo in his yellow submarine. What's coming up on this week's episode of The Skeptic Zone, apart from some sneezes from me? Hopefully not. I visit skeptical HQ, Skeptics Headquarters here in Sydney, and chat to Tim Mendham, the editor of the Skeptic magazine and the executive officer of Australian Skeptics. And we talk about the upcoming Skepticon in Melbourne in December. Maybe the birds outside the window, maybe they are trying to hide from hay fever too. We talk about, uh, yes, Skepticon and uh, general skeptical issues. I was there to record a slew of Book of Tim, book of, Books of Tim, book, Tim, bo- <clears throat> for upcoming weeks. Following that, you can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. I often count on Adrian. Adrian and Faith Rodriguez will talk about the Hawthorne effect. What is the Hawthorne effect? It says here in the show notes, kindly supplied to me by Adrian Hill, the Hawthorne effect is based on poor research done in the 1920s and the 1930s, which infers that people will change their behavior simply because they are being studied. An interesting dive into ooh, psychology, I guess, with Adrian Hill and Faith Rodriguez. Also on this week's show, a good friend of mine, emergency physician Sue Yurachi. Now, I had a coffee with Sue the other day, and we were discussing her first visit in a week or two, to the Mind Body Spirit, or Mind Body Wallet as we call it, festival here in Sydney. What does she expect to encounter? Maybe we can convince Sue to become a Reiki master. Hmm. A real doctor visits Mind Body Wallet. And in fact, I will try to do a report in a couple of weeks when we've gone to that festival. Then to round off the show, the Trove Archives, this time looking at pages in the Sydney Morning Herald, We'll look at articles and items about the late, great Barry Williams, the former editor of the Skeptic magazine and the former president of the Australian Skeptics. A larger-than-life character, a, uh, a man who helped me get onto the committee many years ago, uh, twenty over 20 years ago, and we miss him very much. Barry Williams in the pages of Australian newspapers. Now, don't forget, each week, if you go to the show notes for an episode at SkepticZone.tv, you can see a little little reminder of what we were doing 10 years ago and a link to the episode so you can hear the episode from 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, on episode number 258, we were talking to George Shrub, the wonderful George Shrub, the famous singer and skeptical MC. Stay tuned at the end of the episode for more announcements from me, but now it's time for me to run downstairs and uh, see if I've got some sort of anti-hay fever something or other. Something. Maybe a large handkerchief. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Now, a reading from the Book of Tim, with Tim Mendham. Do you want to 
have a cup of coffee while we're here. Hey, Richard. Uh, hey, there's a cup of coffee you over there. Coffee Would over you there? like a cup of coffee? I'd love a cup of coffee. Let me pass Can you I that... spill it on you? Not on the microphone, dear. Not on the mic- No, on you. On me? Yeah. Well, yes, me, but not on the mic. Would you like a biscuit? Thank you, yes. I'd oh. like a biscuit. Whoa. Mm. Which one we're going to have? Have the uh, that, one. that one. Okay, thank I you. I might have one too, thank okay, you. Brilliant. I'm here. Hey, you're a dunker, aren't you? I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Well, in certain circles. I'm here at Skeptic's headquarters. We're about to record some of the book. Skeptic's Towers. Skeptic's Towers? Well, the birds are very quiet today. Because well, we're up high. <laughs> Top floor of Skeptic's Towers. Of course, we go out and look at the balcony. We can see the birds below us. That's right, right. yeah. yeah. It, is a, it is a very amazing they place. Go away, birds. Where we're here to talk. To hear, here to record the book of Tim. Yes. And I see... In front of you, Tim, you've got lots of books of Tim's okay. ready to go yeah, ready to go in our session. But I thought, uh, and that'll be next week, of course. People Do you realise you just ruined this because people think I memorised these pages and you just crumpled a bit of paper on the microphone like that and sort of... What have I done? What have you done? Oh, no, no. Oh, the trade mm. secrets of... Uh, oh, a nice coffee. Now, uh, before we get into recording the book of Tim, why don't we talk about Skepticon? Why not? Well, let's do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Uh, it's the Australian Skeptics National Convention. It's coming up. When is it coming up? December two to three. Two to three in uh, Melbourne. In Melbourne. Mm. Right? Although there will be sort of um, social functions on the day before. Two to three is a weekend. Yep. And there'll be some functions on the Friday at various locations, or at least one anyway. So mm-hmm. for basically a pub, get together and do whatever you will. And uh, if people leave the pub, eventually they'll eventually, go, go to the meeting. They'll go to Skepticon, which mm. is at the at the I think it's at the Brain Centre. At uh, Melbourne University. It's an appropriate name for it. Well, possibly. Um, Who's, who, who can people expect to see? Well, well, apart from sort of our high-profile international guests, uh, Susan Gerbic, which some of your Susan listeners Gerbic. might have heard of, actually. Possibly. Yeah, no, yeah, she's a bit, a bit obscure, but yeah. But, yeah, she's, I think she's starting to make a name for herself. Oh, that's good. That's I think it's about good, yeah. time, actually. Mm. She's been working hard at it. So anyway, so Susan will be there, possibly to talk about psychic busting. Really? Possibly to talk about Wikipedia. She, she's into that these days, I eh? believe so, mm, yeah. She's okay. busted a few psychics, yeah. <laughs> right. She's a vicious woman. Oh, terrible, <laughs> terrible. And uh, Melanie Tresser King. Yes. Um, who's from the other side of the US, I believe, actually. So I think we're, you're right. Yeah, yeah Susan's, Susan's in California at Salinas, and I think Melody's on the other side, I think. Yes, yes. Anyway, Melanie uh, is an uh, expert in critical thinking techniques, mm. and she develops a particular sort of pattern or formula for uh, working out critical thinking and by, uh, by uh, alternative non-critical thinking, so you can recognise it as well. Um, she works at a, a university, I think, and she's a... I'm trying to think. She's a museum curator. She's a terrific speaker. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, she should be very good, actually, because we have published some stuff in the Skeptics magazine before, mm. uh, which you might be able to download of skeptics.com.au slash magazine. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, and do a search under Melanie um, and see what she has written for us, actually, in the past. So it's good stuff. That will be excellent. And, of course, we have a panoply of Australian uh, speakers. Uh, 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 what? Panoply. It's like a new version of Monopoly. Panoply the game. Yeah, Panoply. (laughs) A Panoply of of, uh, local speakers, um, including uh, John Cook, who's a noted Mm -hmm. uh, climate change uh, expert, who's uh, created the Cranky Uncle... Cartoons, people you got to deal with. Right? The, climate, the climate changed here in the last few days in Sydney. A couple of days ago it was stinking hot and now it's overcast and, and quite cool. It is, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, Sue Irachi, who's an expert on uh, medical areas, and she'll be A, writing, an emergency physician. An emergency Sue, physician, yes. and she'll be writing some articles for the Skeptic magazine on weird medical, well, yes. medical in quotes, yes, like yes. energy medicine and things energy like that. Energy medicine. Uh, she'll be good, yeah. Steve Bavara. Oh, ancient technology sort of. Ancient technology, sort of stuff. ancient astronauts, yes. pseudo-archaeology. Pseudo-archaeology. That, that's always good. Always fun, actually. I think I always enjoy that one. I always like a bit of uh, Von Däniken. You know, it's record. been around for longer than I thought. I've been doing some Pseudo-archaeology research. Pseudo-archaeology has been around thousands of years. It has. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing some research lately down the State Library, and I've, I've come across things from the 19, early 1970s. I suppose that was around the time of Chariots of the Gods, It was. It? Question yeah. mark. Question mark. Chariots of the Gods, question, question mark. mark. Yes, yes. Yes, it was. You know, well, the, the, if you, another article in the Skeptic magazine, which I look at some of these um, ancient astronaut theories of von Däniken and the debunkers of mm-hmm. it, the various books that were out, actually, um, that were sort of, even at the same time, 
uh, debunking von Däniken. One of them written by a senior creationist. Oh, really? Which is all oh, right. Okay, set each other that's upon each other. That, that's interesting. See yes. Which one implodes? Yes. Um, and it's interesting the responses to von Däniken. They weren't even near as successful as von Däniken's books. But yeah, he was writing those in the mid '60s uh, when he was in jail. Yeah. In jail. In jail for fraud. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, why didn't I know that? Well, there we go. He's do. still going, I think. He's still around? He's still yeah. around, He's yeah. Still, he had a book out a number of years ago. Yeah. Surprisingly, it's called Gods or Chariots or something <laughs> like that. He, he, is, he is sort of beating this horse to death. Mm. Actually, I said it's about, about 15 books or something on the same thing. It, it occurred to me many years ago watching Chariots of the Gods. Question mark. Question mark. Oh, you no, know, if you watched it. Yeah. And that didn't have a question mark. The really? documentary didn't I've have got, a I've got a copy of that. I'll have yeah, to have a yeah, look. Yeah, no question, mate. They, was, they were certain. <laughs> what, what made me laugh at the time, I guess I was watching it about 10 years ago, was that the, the fabulous um, things they were comparing, the comparing the ancient uh, technology to were 1960s yes. technology from Earth. And I'm thinking... That's old technology to us now. <laughs> yes, I know. Yes, what, what are these aliens doing? Are they that behind? You know? <laughs> yes, I know. They seem to fit the times, don't they? Yeah. Um, in the same way as uh, you know, the, the spiritualists and the ghost hunters. Whatever happened to ectoplasm? I know. Whatever happened? I liked ectoplasm. It, it was, was like, good old stuff. It was like snotting up chewing gum. It was. <laughs> no, it's all ghost boxes now. Oh, and, ghost boxes. And, and I'm, I'm detecting an, a male energy yeah, I know. around you. Well, there's a father figure coming through. Maybe it's you, or is it the person next to you, or the person three rows back? Yes. Somebody, anybody, no, no. anybody. But, but it's all—it's all ephemeral stuff. I mean, why can't they do the um, chewing gum out of the nose snot routine with ectoplasm? <laughs> <laughs> and it gets everywhere, it gets all over them, and everything. Oh, it's well, maybe it's got well. limited appeal. I don't know, Tim. I well, just it's very don't know. Feeling at the time, apparently. Well, maybe people can see this at the convention in Melbourne. <laughs> we should have a demonstration of ectoplasm. Ooh. I'll get some chewing gum. All right, you get some chewing gum. <laughs> Up one nose and out the other. How can? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a biscuit soon. How can people... Oh, Tim, you shouldn't eat biscuits on, on mm. podcasts. How can people... Um, I'm going to run downstairs and have a biscuit with Tim Mendham. <laughs> How can people find out mine. more about the convention and buy their tickets? Hang on. Oh, good grief. Mouthful of biscuit. How can, can I work under these... your microphone. I can't work mm. under these conditions. Mm. Nothing can I end up with a mouthful of biscuit. <laughs> You go to Skepticon, which is S K E P T I C O N. Yeah. Dot org. Yes. Dot au. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to see, see all the speakers there. Yep. The program, the location, even the prices. Ooh. And people can attend. And they can attend in person or online. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, actually. That's and I think, I think that's becoming the norm. Uh, these days, that people learned a lot of lessons. Any, anywhere around the world. Anywhere around the world. Yeah, that's great. Um, not all the same, at the same time. Hang on, biscuit. At the same time, but of course it might be in the middle of the night in some places because the world is round. These things happen. As you don't. Know. I don't know if you knew, the world is round. Go globular. Yeah, well, I've got to wonder about this. I fly up across the Pacific quite a lot and I can never quite see the curvature of the Earth, so I don't know, Tim. I just don't know. Well, if you don't know, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I think we better... Finish our biscuit and our, co our coffee and get into the... If I can just sum up, Skepticon, December 2 to 3, yeah. you've got to be there or be a, a rhomboid. <laughs> Let's get into the book of Tim and folks, you can hear the first recording next week as soon as we finish our coffee and biscuits. That's right. Hej alla svenskar som lyssnar på The Skeptic Zone podcast. Det är Pontus Böckman från The ESP, The European Skeptics podcast. När ni har lyssnat klart på alla inslag och intervjuer här på The Skeptic Zone så kanske ni har lust att kolla vad som händer på The ESP. Ni hittar oss på theesp.eu där man finner skeptiska nyheter och inslag ur ett europeiskt perspektiv. Vi ses där! You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello everyone, this is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada. 
And today I have the pleasure of being joined by my good friend who is... It is Faith Newsom Rodriguez from Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome, Faith. And today we're going to talk about something pretty interesting. It's called the Hawthorne Effect. And according to the CambridgeDictionary.org, the Hawthorne Effect is, quote, the theory that people's performance at work improves if they know they are being studied or being given special attention by management, end quote. I wanted to look into this further after reading Jonathan Jerry's article, which was published on February 17th, 2023. It was titled, quote, One of the last century's most influential social science studies is pretty bad, end quote. We also briefly touched on it when I interviewed him back in episode number 752. And the story that people like to tell us is that just being part of a study will change our behavior. This was discovered a long time ago. In fact, it was in the 1920s when factory workers were being studied. And we found it pretty interesting, didn't we, Faith? We did. The study took place at a factory in Chicago called Hawthorne Works, and it was owned by Western Electric, and their job was to do telephone relays. And this study occurred between 1924 and 1932. And these studies weren't formally written up, but the conclusions were written in a trade journal, and it kind of took off from there. The first time that it appeared in writing and was called the Hawthorne Effect was in 1953. And after that, it started to show up in university textbooks, such as psychology textbooks. Yes, it's a pretty big phenomenon that that they perpetuate through industrial psychology. And you were right, the studies weren't actually ever published. And I think it wasn't until 2011, one of the articles we looked at by Levitt and List is when they actually were able to find some of the, the data and the research that was done on microfiche and actually found the data points to be able to analyze the actual, what they called the illumination studies. Yes, to see if the results really did produce the effects that became well known. Mm-hmm. Another thing I was reading is that a lot of research studies now do try to implement this based upon the belief that the Hawthorne effect is real. In the first experiment that they did, they had this idea that maybe changing the electric light bulbs could have an effect on productivity. So whether they were brighter or if they were dimmer, but they didn't take into consideration some pretty important factors. What was one of the reasons that people looking at the study after the fact came up with that could explain the increased productivity no matter which light bulb they used, whether it was brighter or dimmer? They were they were changing it on the one day of the week that the all the workers had off. So that was Sunday. And even they knew this at the time because I was reading a little bit before where they had discovered in factory settings that if you worked a worker 72 hours a week, their productivity decreased. But once they dropped the hours that they worked, magically, the worker was able to increase their production rate. So it was well known at that time that there, that if you worked a worker too much or too hard, their productivity would decrease because they needed rest breaks. So obviously, if you're changing the lights on the day that no one's there and everyone is resting, we haven't accounted for the fact that maybe it was the rest break that caused that boost of productivity. We know that now looking at workers is that Monday, for most people that work a Monday through Friday job, Monday is the highest date of productivity with productivity waxing or waning. Yeah, waning towards the end of the week. So this was the first study that they did. And the second study was quite a bit more involved. There were more variables that they looked at. And it was the relay study. Can you explain what that was about, Faith? This is where they um, were looking at how fast or how many relays the women could put together in any given workday. It took, they could put, I think, one together a minute it takes 32 steps to put a relay together and they needed to do nine over nine hours in the day, five and a half days a week. The way they set this study up is the ladies were all, I think, simulated as they would be on the factory floor with all five of them. One would get the supplies, the other four would put things together and they'd drop them down a chute and then they'd be gathered. And whatever was dropped down the chute, it would record 
how many devices they were making. They chose, yeah, they chose one woman. I believe it was Wanda. And Wanda, when they interviewed her 50 years later to ask her about her perspective of it, she actually revealed that she was told by her supervisor, just pick five other women that you think won't get married in the next few years. <laughs> like yeah. that was the whole qualification is, is we just need to figure out like, do we have a worker that is not going to get married or have kids and is going to leave, <laughs> you know, the factory. And what was hilarious is I think they ended up losing three of the women one of them because she moved back to her home country of Norway and the other two because they were too chatty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these five women were put in this separate room and they changed all kinds of variables such as break times longer or shorter, where they were sitting, etc. There were quite a few things that they looked at over quite a length of time. Can you expand on that, please, Faith? They basically changed the whole entire structure of the work environment. So the ladies went into a separate room, but they didn't have the same hierarchical structure of employee-employer that they would have on the factory floor. What is What we have to remind ourselves of is that back in the 1920s, that work environment was entirely different than we have nowadays. I actually do manage and supervise people to a varying degree, and the supervisor that they had probably would be a position that is similar to mine now in my current employment. What that supervisor had the power to do that I don't have the power to do is I can't hire and fire employees at will. Their supervisor could. And in fact, it was a very contentious relationship that their supervisor had with them. He was very rude, would constantly berate them about their production. They could fire you at the drop of a hat, basically. Um, you were yelled at if you talked to other people because it was just focus on your work and do it. And when they moved into this testing room, they didn't have a supervisor. They just had an observer who was there to observe how many devices that they did create. So there wasn't this looming, I want to call like overlord, you know, just making sure you're doing what you need to do, doing your task correctly. So it, it really did change the entire environment of that room. And to put this in perspective, this was during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. One of the things that some of the people who evaluated this experiment said was that money could not have been a motivator for these women. It couldn't have had any effect on their productivity, despite them making double the amount of money than they would have if they had remained on the factory floor. The belief of why money wasn't a motivator is at that time, you know, we had most young people would go in and work because they had their family, their siblings, their parents to support. And that was the case for several of these women. One of them actually lied about her age and said that she was 17. And she was actually 14 when she started working there because she had to help support her parents and her six siblings. Women at that time, you went to work, but your money wasn't your own. You, you passed that on to either the male or you know whoever the matriarchal figure was of your family, if there wasn't like if your father, your grandfather wasn't alive to handle everything. So I believe it was Teresa. She said that she just handed over her money to her mother, didn't even look in the envelope. And that was that. But the motivator was, is that she's taking care of her six siblings, her mother and her grandparents. So the money was extremely important at that time. Extremely important, especially at the at that time where if you, she knew that she was getting twice the amount of money that any other regular worker would be when there was job shortages, that would be probably a pretty big motivator for anybody to do what we need to do to stay in the study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was really interesting how the original people who conducted this study were really adamant that money was not something that mm -hmm. was motivating these women. But there were other factors that were motivating them. The fact that on the main factory floor, they weren't able to talk and get to know each other. And they, the ladies discussed when they were in this room, they got to know their co-workers. They got to know the people that were supervising them, the person who was observing them, as well as the clerical ladies that were responsible for things. And they described it as being a family. It was unheard of back then. Like now we know that we can socialize and talk and I know it's cliche, but I consider my coworkers, my family, like we know what's going on with each other's lives. And I do work in a production-based office environment. It's very strange to hear that, that these women would get yelled at and get berated for sitting and talking to each other. 
And all they were supposed to do was sit down and focus on doing these 32 steps and creating this, you know, relay device every minute. Very dehumanizing. Very dehumanizing that your whole job is that you're just this cog in a machine. And here you get moved into a room and you realize my coworkers are actually pretty cool. (laughs) They're very interesting people. And when you have this big, huge societal change happening, the Great Depression, people losing their jobs, the Hawthorne effect, I guess, really isn't you know, this, you're being observed, but it's more so of if we care about our workers, we ask questions, we give them an environment in which they're able to have some agency, they're able to create a place that they will try to figure out how to make their work more productive if they like where they're working. Yeah, it's so strange to me that they made all of these changes, Mm -hmm. but didn't compare to the other people on the floor. Mm -hmm. They just looked at changing within this small room with these five people. So they just Mm -hmm. thought, well, no matter what we do, production is increased. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit, Adrian, that this the interviews of these ladies took place 50 years after the studies had ended. I think they ended in 1932. So they were interviewed around 1980, 1981. And nobody took the time to kind of do a debriefing with them about what did you feel was the you know biggest benefit. It's, it's just so weird, like looking back at this in a 21st century perspective and realizing profound things were happening <laughs> in HR at that time. And, and they were missing it. And they were totally, it was just flying above their heads just because, you know, women were still, you're expected to do this work, but you're going to have babies and get married. And we, we really don't care. <laughs> Yeah, it was these the men who were mm-hmm. conducting the experiment, and it never mm-hmm. went beyond that. They never asked the women mm-hmm. for their thoughts. So speaking of these women who were in the study, they were interviewed 50 years later, and it was written up in a paper called Hawthorne, a half century later, Relay Assembly Participants Remember. It was written by Ronald G. Greenwood, Alfred A. Bolton, and Regina A. Greenwood. And within this study, they actually have a transcript of questions and answers from these women. They were able to find five of the eight original participants in the study. Three of them had to leave, as we discussed earlier. There were always five who were participating in the study at any one time. All five of the people that they found 50 years later were living in Chicago still. We're going to do something kind of fun now. Faith and I are going to read from this transcript, and I'm going to be the interviewer. And Faith is, first of all, going to be Teresa, and then she's going to be Wanda. And my first question is, what did you like about the test room? And Teresa said it was because we made more money in the test room. And why do you think output kept going up? Teresa said, I think it was because we were more relaxed. We didn't see the boss, didn't hear him, and I hated him after he bawled me out about the wire in my finger. So about that wire in her finger, what apparently happened Mm -hmm. was she got this wire and one supervisor who was quite kind to her removed it from her finger and she carried on working. But her main boss found out about it and got pretty angry at her. He basically came up to her and was just like out of the blue, like, what are you supposed to do if you get a wire in your finger? Like, what are you supposed to do? And she's like, I'm supposed to go to the hospital. And he's like, exactly. You're supposed to go to the hospital. You didn't go to the hospital. You know, I could see how if one supervisor tells you, oh, it's okay. We've taken care of it. We don't need to go. You can go back working. And then you have another one come up to you that is talking to you this way. Like suddenly, you know, I'm about to lose my job. He's going to discipline me. He's going to do something to just make my life horrible. Yeah, it was a power play Mm -hmm. between supervisors. And she was in the middle. Yeah. Okay, next question, and this is about the supervisor. He evidently put fear into a lot of people. And Teresa said, oh, yes, he was mean. He died, and I didn't even go see him. (laughs) (laughs) Good for you, Teresa. Yes. Next question. What did you do in the office? Wanda said, we just talked. They just let us do more of the talking, I think. I think when you're more relaxed, you just work, you produce more. I think in anything, if you're relaxed, you can do a better job on anything. Pretty insightful, 50 years later. And the next question is about the mean supervisor. And his name was Mr. Platenka. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's the one who yelled about the wire. The question is, did Mr. Platenka 
ever tell you to stop talking? Wanda said he thought I was talking and I wasn't paying attention when I was talking and working. You know, that time he told me about it. She describes a time where she was working and I guess had her head up. They would, I guess, scan the rooms to make sure, you know, your head would have to be down and focused on this task. And if you looked like you were trying to communicate with the other workers, they would come over there and you know, give you a stern talking to. And next, could they talk as much in the regular department? As Wanda says, well, those days, supervisors didn't allow it. If they saw you look up and smile, they'd ask you if you were on a picnic. I remember somebody said that to me. You think you're at a picnic? And I just put my head down. We were afraid in those days. Yeah, so sad. Yeah, you know, and it's just the idea of somebody coming up and being like snarking like that. Like, what do you think you're doing? Now the last question. The test room was a real different environment. And Teresa said, that's why we all worked better. Wanda said, I think so. I think we were happy, you know, together. You didn't have to be afraid to look up. We saw a couple of people, Mr. Chipman, and he was their observer, and others. We'd smile and we talked like a happy family. I think that made a difference. We had the desire to work. You just couldn't help it. You got the rhythm and it wasn't hard. Seems pretty reasonable. Essentially what happened is they liked going to work instead of dreading it. Mm -hmm. these, are, yeah, these are things we know now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think we've done a pretty good deep dive of the Hawthorne effect and what it is or what it isn't. I'd like to end with a quote from a paper that was called, Was There Really a Hawthorne Effect at the Hawthorne Plant? An Analysis of the Original Illumination Experiments. And the authors are Stephen D. Levitt and John A. List. They said, quote, perhaps the most important lesson to be learned from the original Hawthorne experiments is the power of a good story. The mythology surrounding the Hawthorne experiments arose largely absent careful data analysis and has persisted for decades, even in the face of strong evidence against it, generated by Frankie and Call, 1978, and Jones, 1992. End quote. And it's still persisting in 2023. Well, Faith, thank you again for joining me on this episode. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again. And until next time, this is Adrian Hill. Every family has one. You can summon aliens with your mind. The only reason why we can't see them is because we're impure and they're pure. They might be your parents, your siblings, your cousins and your friends. Look, she believes that lizard people are walking on the face of the earth. They might be your teachers, your police officers and your lawyers. It's just like, if you disagree with us, there are going to be severe consequences. They could even be your elected representatives. Everyone is out to get you. Everyone with the PhD and MD, everyone in the government is out to get you personally. We watched them storm the capital of the United States. I mean, if I'd have told you on January 5th that any group of people would try to overthrow the U.S. government, you said, no, of course not. We saw them occupy Ottawa. Scientific proof that racism doesn't exist. Their sources are always, trust me, bro. But what no one is talking about is how they're destroying relationships. I don't think people realize how damaging it is to families. They are QAnon, and these are the stories of the people who love them. Like, if I play into their fantasies, I can make them believe anything I want. Look for the Q-Dropped podcast on your favorite podcast platform, including YouTube, or go to porthosmedia.net slash QDropped. What a nice day for a coffee. I'm with a very nice person, a, a friend of mine, Sue Yirachi. Hello, Sue. Hello, all the skeptics listening. It's Ooh. really good to be sharing a coffee with Richard today. It's a nice place to have a coffee. We're, uh, we're just opposite your house. There's a coffee shop. How good is That's that? That's right. I'm lucky, aren't I? <laughs> 
Now, you are a very interesting person. You are an emergency physician. That's true. I um, trained in hospitals in Australia and I specialised in emergency medicine. And then after nearly 40 years in the hospital system, I now do emergency telemedicine. How does that work? So I work from home and I work for a company that has a whole range of contracts from ambulance services to aged care facilities to private apps on your phone and we cover a lot of after hours emergencies with people who need sometimes urgent treatment, sometimes advice and we mostly aim to keep pressure off emergency departments. Sometimes though we advise people to go there. Oh yes, yeah. You must get some very, um, I don't want to say desperate, very concerned people contacting you. Definitely, and one of the things that I've realised from working for this service is that a lot of attendances at emergency or calls to ambulance happen because people have no way of assessing either how urgent or how severe their symptoms actually are. So I really enjoy being able to explain the way the body works and how physiology works so that I'm not just reassuring or dismissing the symptoms but actually helping people understand why they may or may not be urgent. Now speaking about how the body works and how medicine works in general, you have been, and I've I've rescued you for a coffee, but you're down the rabbit hole. You have gone (laughs) down more rabbit holes than I can imagine because I gave you a giant file full of skeptical health matters. Everything from Reiki to applied kinesiology to bioresonance. And uh, my question is, are you mad getting into all of this? <laughs> I have to admit I jumped into that rabbit hole with great gusto oh, yes. because um, I've got a combination of curiosity, amusement, but also some concern about where um, unproven or unscientific therapies are actually taking advantage of people both financially and also sometimes in a real health um, danger. But just for my perverse sense of humour, I can find it very amusing to see how people describe what they think they're doing and how it works. Well, you and I have both been watching videos of people doing things like applied kinesiology and these zapping machines, and they are um, they're so sincere. To my, my way of thinking, these people who are doing this stuff, which we know is nonsense, appear to be very sincere. They do seem to be, don't they? And I think it's important that we recognise that not everybody involved in pseudoscience understands that what they're doing is pseudoscience. And earlier on we were talking about the model I've thought of of the cargo cult, where people who don't have a good understanding of science and technology almost see it as this miraculous thing. And so... Yeah. They end up with a copy of a scientific machine that goes ping and produces, ping. produces um, diagrams. Yes. And they almost worshipping the type of science that they're rejecting. Interesting. I haven't thought about it from that point of view because they, certain naturopaths, for example, might invest in a machine that we know is nonsense. It's been invented by people to make money out of gullible people. That's right. Uh, But these same naturopaths will often reject science except for this machine, which they think is new and cutting-edge quantum science or something. Exactly that. Isn't it paradoxical that they reject the science of physiology and pathology, but they'll be mesmerised by technology and machines that are pseudoscientific? They go ping. That's right. That's why I think the cargo (laughs) cult is a good analogy. Now, you are brave enough. You've uh, accepted my invitation to come to Mind Body Wallet in a, a, a week or so. We're off to Mind Body Wallet here in Sydney. I've taken the challenge. I think it's going to be good fun. In fact, the real challenge for, for me will be to control my eye rolling and well, um, go there sincerely. Yeah, we learnt long ago that the, the, the best use of our time at these places, unless we see something which is of immediate danger which is possible is the best thing to do is simply to innocently ask questions and the best question you can ask is oh how does it work that's right and it'll be it'll be really fascinating to see whether the people running the stalls are just hired for the day and being paid their hourly rate to market something like they do at any festival 
or whether we come across the true believers who really think that there's something complex in there that even they don't understand but they know that it's true there'll be both yes. you'll get the people who are simply there to man that's the right term these days the stall to to um what, what would you say these days you don't say you don't man a stall anymore you um attend oh, it or attend? something attend yes. you, listeners know what i mean you so you get those people and they're by and large innocent okay they haven't done their due diligence but then you get the people who um uh, to to an extent no it's not real but it's a business I think it'll be interesting to see whether we're able to ask questions in a non-threatening way or whether the people who've got a bit more inkling that they might be deceptive become hyper-vigilant. Oh, and they, they can notice, be defensive, yeah. Yes. Very much so. Their defensiveness might be a reflection of the degree to which they're perceptive about the, yeah. the deception. Interesting. So, listeners, this is something to look forward to in a, a couple of weeks' time. Sue and I, and I think Tim Mendham, will have our post, post mind, body, wallet interview, <laughs> and we'll right. tell you all about it. But for now, after that lovely cup of coffee, Sue Yurachi, thanks very much. Great to speak with you, Richard. Skeptic Zone listeners, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Wikipedia Project. I also explore the world of psychic mediums, grief vampires, and expose their tricks and methods to exploit people. If you'd like to join me on this journey, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Psychics Explained. Or if you need help remembering that name, it's also Psychic Sex Plained. I think I'll get a lot more viewers that way. But please join the conversation and subscribe. Now it's time once again to go back to those trove archives and other newspaper archives from around the world. Well, mostly in Australia. Now, normally we raid the archives at Trove itself at trove.nla.gov.au. But this week, I've been raiding my files, my personal files, and also I had a couple of trips to the State Library of New South Wales. Now, the State Library of New South Wales, they have a, uh, a giant collection of newspapers on microfilm. And this is the sort of microfilm that comes in long rolls. You put into a machine and you scroll through and up on the monitor appears the newspaper in question and you can do searches online then go and raid the cabinets the many cabinets there pull out the microfilm and uh, search for your story and this is for papers such as the sydney morning herald which we'll be looking at today in references to the late great barry williams and he was also the longtime editor of the magazine The Skeptic, which is now edited for some years by Tim Mendham. But over the years, Barry did appear many times in stories and uh, things like letters to the editor in the Sydney Morning Herald. So I thought we'd take a look at some of those. And in no order in particular, we find ourselves on the 10th of June, 1991. And there's a picture of Barry Williams, a close-up of Barry with his big beard, and he's staring at a bent spoon. And the caption reads, Straight talker, chief skeptic Mr. Barry Williams says spoon bending is about muscle over matter. And that's a photograph by Andrew Taylor, and this is a story by Tina Diaz. See how easy it is to bend the truth? While most people who saw the first photograph of the abominable snowman were quick to believe great hairy yetis wandered the Himalayas, some paused to think, could Bigfoot be a fraud? The world's skeptics now sit back and smile as the only evidence photographs of yeti footprints and scalps has been exposed as fake. 
But they wonder why some people, after being told there is no evidence to prove the existence of Bigfoot, still believe Yetis are alive and well. The Bigfoot saga was one of the topics at the Australian Skeptics Association's 7th Annual Convention in Sydney at the weekend. The scene was odd. Skeptics listening to skeptics talk about skepticism. Well, what do people expect when they go to a convention? Soon I hope to be at an origami convention, and I'll be an origami folder, listening to talks about origami by origami folders. Hmm. The association's president, Mr. Barry Williams, said most people were gullible and wanted to believe interesting stories, but should be skeptical about everything. If you've got a blundering, inarticulate twit telling you something, you're not going to believe it, are you? He said. If you speak to a car salesman or real estate agent, you're going to be cautious. So why should you believe everyone? Mr. Williams always has a point to prove if handed a spoon. Anyone can bend it if they apply pressure to the middle of the handle. You don't need psychic powers to bend a spoon, just physical strength. So don't believe otherwise. He said, as serious as being sceptical may sound, sceptics at yesterday's conference said they were not so sceptical that they extracted the humour from every tale, but just cautious enough to be wary of certain people and stories. Dr Colin Groves, a reader in anthropology at the Australian National University, said yesterday's speaker on yetis admitted he believed in the 1960s there was a chance that Bigfoot existed. He started to question it when one report revealed that one paw was a snow leopard's, not a yeti's. I guess I wanted them to exist. It's an exciting idea. These large creatures more closely related to us than chimps. And they've been hiding for so long, Dr. Grove said. Many people in Russia still believe in the yeti. I don't know why. They now look in the Tenshan Mountains in the Soviet Union and China. He said, There are still many Yeti enthusiasts in the Western world. Some scientists still look. And now we go back a few years to 1987 on the 13th of August in the Sydney Morning Herald. Ian Cockrell meets a self-appointed watchdog for the blindly trusting. It's fun to shoot down UFOs and con men. In profile, Barry Williams. Believe it or not, Mr. Barry Williams is mainly in it for the fun. It may be little comfort for unscrupulous magicians or the gurus of pseudo-religions, but it is amusing for those who have seen the national president of the Australian Skeptics in action. Mr. Williams enjoys exposing charlatans, not in a malicious way, but methodically. The 48-year-old Roseville man places his faith in things that are supported by scientific evidence and scrutiny. His 600-strong organization is the self-appointed watchdog for the blindly trusting. It tackles people who would seek to profit from the ingenuous among us. It is also a voluntary organization whose members share a fascination for the infinite gullibility of mankind and the subjects which snare people's interests and money. One-fifth of the members live on Sydney's North Shore. I find it intellectually stimulating and a lot of fun, said Mr. Williams, a trade exhibitor promoter. I've built up an immense library since joining the Skeptics, and if I didn't have scruples myself, with the things I've seen I could become enormously wealthy. In fact, we joke at the branch meetings about setting up a religious or psychic body to make our fortunes. The Australian Skeptics were formed in 1981, promoted by a UFO sighting in New Zealand, Dick Smith, Philip Adams and Mark Plummer decided to organise a body to investigate such claims. Smith and Adams, with the former head of the CSIRO, Dr Paul Wilde, remained the patrons. I had the first inkling I was a sceptic when I read Chariots of the Gods, Mr Williams said. I thought it was fascinating until I got to the bit about the pyramids. I remember thinking, this is tripe. Later I was watching Dick Smith being interviewed about UFOs, and I began to think I was the only person who didn't believe in them. Then Dick said it was time somebody challenged the existence of things like UFOs. I wrote to him saying if he ever got something off the ground, I was interested. 
I have a natural antipathy for being ripped off by charlatans. The skeptics' targets range from psychics to astrologers and fringe religious organisations. We mainly concern ourselves with paranormal events and pseudoscience, Mr Williams said. Currently there is a fad on channeling, which is really a high-tech name for spiritualism. Astrology seems to be on the wane, although there are still those who firmly believe in it. At our national convention in Melbourne last year, we had members collect all the astrological charts for one week, and of course, they were all different. We tend to steer clear of religions, except for the creation science people and the Scientologists, but in taking on those, we have the support of the major churches. We are not vindictive about it. A lot of psychics sincerely believe they have some sort of power, but there are the ones who get away from reading tea leaves and are aware what they are doing is taking people's money, and it can be dangerous. Just look at the tragic case in Newport recently, when a guy cut his hand off in the belief it would release him for astral travelling. It's tough enough in this world as it is, without being conned all the time. To make it tougher on the tricksters, the Australian sceptics have put up $20,000 for anyone who can perform a paranormal act under scientific scrutiny. With its American parent organization, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, and branches in other countries, the group has more than $250,000 on offer worldwide to anyone willing to accept the challenge. Not surprisingly, nobody has been able to prove they have these powers, Mr. Williams said. Fortunately, we have no really bad practitioners in this country. Australians tend to be more sceptical by and large than other races. It's a healthy state of mind. But I think our education system is to blame for not teaching kids to examine critically things presented to them. And the media is partly to blame for reporting sensational stories. Just look at that woman who claims she knew where the Colossus of Rhodes was. We've locked horns with her before. It turned out to be something some Greek travel agent had dreamed up. To demonstrate how readily people accept the credentials of those claiming psychic powers, the skeptics perpetrated a hoax a few years ago when they brought over a magician member from America. He was touted as a psychic and appeared twice on Bert Newton's television show before revealing the fraud on his third appearance. The switchboard was jammed with complaints from people annoyed at being conned, Mr Williams said. They didn't thank him for helping to show them how easy it was to be taken in by a good con man couching things in esoteric jargon. And the photograph accompanying the picture is Barry Williams with his uh, index finger up to his eyebrow looking sceptical. And uh, the caption reads, Mr. Barry Williams, if I didn't have scruples, I could become enormously wealthy. And finally, from 1994, on the uh, 13th of June in the Sydney Morning Herald, Barry's Bent on Panning Paranormal Piffle by Malcolm Knox. And we have an image here of Barry Williams in front of a projector casting a big shadow of a bent spoon. Australian Skeptics, Inc., the Great Society for Doubters, Unbelievers and the Determinately Rational has a potential new motto. Quote, cut down the tall poppycock, end quote. The Society's highest honour, the Bent Spoon Award, quote, for the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal piffle, end quote, over the past year, was presented at its 10th annual conference yesterday. The President, Mr Barry Williams, said the award went to the Federal Attorney General, Mr. Michael Lavarch, quote, in a contentious decision, end quote, for allowing staff in his department to get medical certificates from naturopaths, homeopaths, and faith healers. The runner-up was Brisbane City Council for forbidding the number of four in any new developments because the number four is unlucky for the Chinese said Mr. Williams, head of an organisation which insists on spelling sceptic with the American K. The two-day, politically incorrect conference attracted 150 card-carrying sceptics from as far as Townsville, Adelaide, Melbourne and the Gold Coast. Targets for the society's analysis included the greenhouse effect. Well, that's interesting. I wonder what that, uh, that talk was about. Satanic ritual abuse alternative medicine, and the risks of living beneath 
power lines. The suggested new motto came from Professor Colin Kay, formerly Associate Professor of Physics at Newcastle University, who addressed the conference on myths about nuclear energy. The supposed risks were, quote, imaginings of the popular press, and quote, one speaker said. The audience looked sceptical. There we are, some of the references to Barry Williams over the years. There are more, and in fact, I think I'll be writing an article for The Skeptic magazine about some of Barry's uh, letters to the editor over the years. One in which he, uh, he attacks astrology. It's quite interesting. The late, great Barry Williams, a larger-than-life character of modern skepticism in Australia. And if you want to find out more, why don't you go to trove at trove.nla.gov.au, type in Australian Skeptics, or Australian Skeptics and Barry Williams or Astrology, because you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Now here's some news from our dear friends and colleagues over in the UK. The uh, recent QED question, explore, discover in Manchester was a great success, I hear. And they awarded the Occam. The Occam. Knowledge Fight podcast wins Skeptical Activism Occam Award, says the, uh, the press release in the pages of the Skeptic magazine from the UK at skeptic.org.uk. Now, that's interesting. That's a podcast I have not heard of. It might be worth checking out. Also, they awarded the Rusty Razor, which is similar to the Australian Skeptic's Ben Spoon Award, and that went to cardiologist and anti-vax influencer Dr. Asim Malhotra. You can read all about those two awards over at their website, and I will add a link in this week's show notes. Coming up on next week's episode of The Skeptic Zone, the Trove section will look at naturopathy, or naturopathy, depending on how you pronounce it. We have another installment from the Book of Tim. Adrian Hill will read the Australian Skeptics newsletter, and uh, well, we'll wait to see what else comes up. The following week, so the episode scheduled for the 15th of October, I hope to have a report from the Mind Body Wallet Festival. But for this week and holding my sneezes, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, TikTok and YouTube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the Skeptic Zone podcast or any other sceptical organisation. Okay, folks, it's the end of the show, and uh, oh, I'm back in the cafe with Sue Yuraji. I've come all the way back. We've had another coffee, because Sue, who you heard earlier in the show, Sue, this is the part of the show where we roll the dice, and I've given you a 10-sided dice in a little origami box. You have, and I'm very conscious of the responsibility of this (laughs) event. (laughs) So you at home and Sue here in the cafe, we're going to play the game. I'm going to roll this 10-sided die three times, and it's up to all of us. I'll play along too to use our psychic predicting power mm. to predict the number. What number do you predict, Sue? I predict eight. Let's see, out of ten, I'm going to predict, um, oh, I'll predict seven. So here we go. Oh, it's ten. <laughs> oh, no, neither of us were neither. psychic today. No, okay, that's roll one. We get two more okay, rolls. Okay, two more. Yep. Best of three, right? Yes. What <laughs> number now? Now four. Four. I'm, I'm going to say five. Okay. Six. (laughs) 
We've still got one more opportunity. One more opportunity. What number? This time I'll say nine. I'm going to say one. Here we go. Six again. Six. Oh, no. Well, you know, that wasn't a scientific trial, but there are lots of reasons I can give for why it didn't work because oh, yeah. I actually do have psychic powers, oh. but you'll find that um, this particular cafe, I think, has lead in the walls, so the energy doesn't flow to me directly. I knew there would be a logical reason. Yes, of course. And... There are other reasons too. I noticed that the table that we spun the die on, dice, die, die. singular, yeah. it, um, I think they might have implanted something underneath that actually directs the way the die rolls because normally when I do this, I get three out of three. So it's not possible that this was a reasonable test. I think you should apply for the Skeptics $100,000 challenge. You sound just like the psychics who <laughs> fail and come up with the, <laughs> with the explanations. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Bye, Skeptics. 